This is CBC Here and Now. The stressful part was not knowing where we'd be delivering. I think every expecting mother that is due the next couple months has been tracking this for uh, a long time. A special delivery for moms to be in Gander. No more traveling to another town to give birth. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. We'll get ready to say goodbye to plastic bags. As of July 1st, they'll be banned from all stores across Newfoundland and Labrador. The province passed the law last year but hadn't worked out the details. Here's what we know now. Some stores aren't waiting for the ban. Sobeys will stop handing out plastic this Friday. But it's not a total elimination. You'll still be able to get plastic bags for your winter tires, dry cleaning, fruits and vegetables, and meat products. So how will Newfoundlanders and Labradorians adjust to a plastic-free shopping experience? Well, documents obtained by Here and Now show that if the NLC is any example, there will be few complaints. Our Peter Cowan explains. It's been more than a year since the liquor store stopped handing out plastic bags. Every year there are more than 4 million transactions, but fewer than a dozen people rode in with their reaction to the switch, and many applauded the move. There might be some pushback, but the vast majority of people appreciate your commitment to our environment, one person wrote, after witnessing a customer berating staff because there was no plastic bag. CBC got a copy of these emails through access to information. The NLC says it's not surprised. I don't think we were surprised because it was such a positive for the environment and there was so much news out there on the environment and the impact of plastic on marine life. So it was just us being a good corporate citizen and, and implementing something that could help the environment. The Liquor Corporation used to hand out 4.9 million plastic bags a year. Now you can bring your own reusable bag, take a paper bag, use a box, or buy a reusable bag for a dollar. NLC doesn't make any money off the reusable bags either, they sell them at cost. Not everyone is happy though. Larger liquor bottles don't fit in the small paper bags. One person wrote in to say, I was forced to walk out of the store with a bottle in my hand. Do you realize the danger you're putting me in? One wrong person sees this and I could be attacked. I won't shop for alcohol again. Why not just stock bigger bags though? Most of our products actually fit within that one bottle paper bag. There's a very small percentage of our products that don't fit in that bag. So as of now anyway, we've made that decision not to go with bigger bags. While the environment may have been the motivator, a bag ban is also good for the Crown Corporation's bottom line. It saved $130,000 last year by not buying plastic bags, and that's extra money it's handing over to the province. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, after two years of traveling back and forth between Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor, pregnant women can once again give birth in their own town. The James Patton Hospital is back in the baby business. CBC's Garrett Berry has this update. Back home in Gander and things are going great. Bringing Luke into the world had its share of complications. Uh, it was fairly difficult, very sort of traumatic, and um, I mean the doctors and the nurses were great, but it was it was a rough delivery, which is why I was there for an extended period of time. On top of all that, she was almost a hundred kilometers from home, and bills racked up, with her parents renting out a spot at a campground nearby. It's probably not more difficult for me, but certainly for family members who who want to be there. Um, especially my husband, he took extra days off work. Just one of many women who've made that trip, from Gander to Grand Falls, Windsor, to deliver their babies. It is disappointing, and um, I was told when I was pregnant that I, I would be able to deliver in Gander, that they would have it up and running by then, and unfortunately they didn't. Obstetrics in Gander's hospital has been missing for two years, and even before 2018, availability was inconsistent. Central Health says that's now all over. The biggest challenge really was around the physician piece, so we needed to ensure that we had physicians who were committed to working here and not just locum providers who would come for a period of time and then leave. We want to make sure that there are physicians on the ground who can provide the service at any time of day. And you feel like you have that now? We do have that. Uh -huh. Where's he going to land on your head? Yeah. And that's welcome news for expecting moms. Because at 35 weeks last time, I wasn't, uh, one second, Ben, okay? 
I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to deliver in Gander. So there's that, that unknown is, is a really huge deal on any expecting mom. Ben was born in Gander in 2017. Now his mom is breathing a sigh of relief, knowing she'll be staying close to home for her next baby. It's something that's like so important for our community. And to continue, like, like you said, you want to develop this town, you want the population to grow. How else are you going to do that but to have a hospital that can deliver babies? Garrett Berry, CBC News, Gander. Thank you. If you use social media at all, you've probably come across this. We always knew that Dolly Parton was one of the uh, you know, celebrities that was uh, on the Hey Orca platform. All these viral uh, memes that you see on the internet actually came from a platform that was built locally. You can trace its origins back right here to this local tech startup. I'll tell you more coming up. sunshine in play across areas uh, for the Avalon, but we do still have a low pressure system, uh, or rather the effects of a low pressure system still sitting over the uh, island. We've got an area of high pressure just to the west right now. That's going to sink further south as we uh, head through the next couple of days. That means that this area of low pressure is going to skirt south of us, but then that's going to lead to the uh, potential to see a low pressure system come right up our way as we head towards the weekend. Looks like uh, Sunday and Monday is what we're in for. I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a teacher in Avondale is being investigated by police. CBC News learned of the investigation this afternoon, but as our Ryan Cook reports, few other details are avail available. The RCMP is confirming today that they're looking into the conduct of a teacher at Roncalli Central High School in Avondale. Now, at this point, it's not clear what the nature of the complaint was or whether or not the teacher has been suspended. All the school district will say is that they take all complaints seriously and in some cases conduct their own internal investigations. We reached out to the teachers union this morning, but we haven't heard back. This is the third teacher investigation we've heard of in the last 10 months. You'll remember last March, CBS principal Rob McGraw was charged after allegedly assaulting four students with disabilities. And then just before the school year started, substitute teacher Krista Grimes was charged with sexual exploitation after an alleged incident in Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove. To date, there's been no charges stemming from the most recent investigation. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. A St. John's-based startup company helped the latest viral meme make its way to the internet. Hey Orca lets big brands keep track of social media content. Country music legend Dolly Parton's team uses it to schedule posts, including the one that has taken off. Here now is Katie Breen reports. This is the template that's taken the internet by storm four pictures stacked together that poke fun at the different personas people use on social media. Dolly Parton started it, and a ton of others have jumped on board. Big celebrities like Oprah, Celine, even museums have put versions together. They call it the Dolly Parton Challenge. I just think people think it's so relatable, and it's hilarious as well. Joe Teo is the CEO of Peorca. You look at that original post on Twitter, and there, at the very bottom, his business. Dolly Parton's social media team, working nine to five, uses a tool made here to schedule online posts. So basically, Hey Orca is a platform that helps social media teams work um, better together. So if you're managing like a really important brand like uh, Dolly Parton, you'll be able to see all of the plants uh, in one place. And you can actually see exactly, you know, what your Twitter post is gonna look like, and then you can sort of like look at, you know, what this Facebook post is gonna look like. And so we're able to have like a conversation here and say, hey, we have to change this. You know, this is not accurate and things like that. It's all built here on Kenmount Road in St. John's. 15 employees, almost 500 clients, mostly in the U.S. Last year, more than a million social media posts were scheduled through the Hayorka platform. You know, we always say that we're a world-class software served with Newfoundland hospitality. Tio says being based on the island is a good thing. The tech sector is really taking off here, and company founders help each other. You know, we really believe in, um, you know, the, the concept of community over competition. You know, if we work together, a rising tide lifts all boats. In 10 years, Tio figures tech will significantly contribute to the province's GDP, help diversify the economy. And Dolly Parton, using his software, 
it's a testament that you can build something significant here. You can be a company here in Newfoundland, but still have a global impact on pop culture. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. The province's finance minister is willing to sit down with QP and talk issues. But Tom Osborne says he's disappointed in the tactics the public sector union is using. Collective agreements for both QP and NAEP expire at the end of March. Government and NAEP have negotiated a tentative two-year extension that includes a pay raise, but QP says it's not ready to sign on to the extension yet, saying it doesn't like template bargaining. Tonight, Osborne is responding to that. We sat in front of uh, QP. We um, put the proposal that, that we've reached with another union on the table and we'd clearly indicated to them at the time, you know, this is not do or die. This is what we've uh, gotten with another union. Uh, we don't like giving one union more than we give another. So we'd like to achieve the same with all unions uh, to be fair to everybody. Well, a man who was a former union leader in this province has died. One of the comments I heard about you when you got in as Minister of Labour is that you're a street fighter. Well, sir, the people in this hall are street fighters. Sure they are. And sure. we're going to take you on wherever, whenever we get an opportunity to do so. Wayne Ralph led the United Food and Commercial Workers Union in the late 80s, a time when labor leaders didn't hold back telling politicians what they thought of them. The UFCW represented fish plant workers and back then was often involved in confrontations with its rival, the FFAW. Ralph was 68 years old. While missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is an international crisis, the Mi'kmaq Band on the West Coast wants to build a space for victims and families living in their own backyard. Troy Turner has more from Cornerbrook. A few steps from the Halibut office on Church Street in Cornerbrook, across the road and onto an existing green space. It's a pile of snow at the moment. But this will be the site of the commemorative garden for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And it's something that doesn't have to dig down into the ground or anything like that. And it's very transferable to other locations. And we're very hopeful that we can work with other communities within our territory because we are very uh, far reaching and, um, and have these spaces for our membership throughout the province. There will be several elements of the medicine wheel in the garden. It will be a circular gathering space and meant to accommodate 100 people. The garden will be built on land donated by the city, and the hope is to see community groups use it throughout the year. An inquiry found that Indigenous women and girls are 12 times more likely to be murdered than any other demographic. A report released in 2019 included recommendations to address endemic levels of violence. For some, it might seem um, like an inquiry and an issue that is very far removed from here locally in our Indigenous community, but that's not the case. There are, are families and, and victims right in our own backyard, and um, it's really nice to give them a voice in doing projects like this. Halibu hopes to have the garden to be located here behind me, open by October 4th. That's the commemorative day for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Suggestions on the garden's final design are still being accepted on the website, halibu.ca. Troy Turner, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, it's Bell Let's Talk Day. The annual awareness campaign, which is in its 10th year, is Bell's corporate commitment to mental health in Canada. Premier Dwight Ball took part in a flag raising at Confederation Building today. People all across the province also got involved, encouraging conversation and positive change for those living with mental health issues. Today is also a major fundraiser for mental health initiatives across the country, with donations made for every every text and social media post using the Bell Let's Talk hashtag. Mental health is a serious condition and it's going to take all of us as a community to address it. Our attitudes and the attitudes of the general public are causing problems for people with mental health and addictions. It's time to get it out in the open. It's time to talk about it. It's Bell Let's Talk Day, so let's talk. At a ceremony in St. John's today, eight people received the highest honor this province can award them, the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. We love you, we love you, we love you, 
Today's eight inductees come from all fields, from real estate operator Jim Burton, who is also known for his volunteer work, to philanthropist Lane Dobbin, to the man known as Santa, Bruce Templeton. The award pays tribute to people who demonstrate excellence and achievement in any field that benefits this province and its residents. No question, our province is a better place to live because of this year's eight recipients. And I want to thank you on behalf of every single Newfoundlander and Labradorian for the work that you've done. But more than that, there are people that are listening, the people who will look at you and read your resumes. You are now an inspiration for others because the province knows you a little better today. Well, what do horses and hockey have in common? Well, one could help raise $100,000 for the other. Coming up, I'll tell you about how the good deeds of one Kiwi hockey team in Torbay could give a big boost for the therapeutic program here at Rainbow Riders in St. John's. All they need now is your help. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. You're watching here and now. Bonjour to the Hello, 
<laughs> you hear that part? News. We're on the news. <laughs> How adorable so is that? So sweet. That was uh, Ms. Blake's grade five class and Ms. Wells' uh, grade one class at uh, Holy Family Elementary School in Paradise. Ashley and I were there this morning for Literacy Day and it was so much fun. It really was fun and I got to talk to uh, two grade five classes so mm -hmm. obviously the first thing we talked about was weather. Mm -hmm. Lots of and questions lots I'm sure. Lots of questions especially about the blizzard but then one of them came up to me afterwards and said I think you just inspired me to be a meteorologist Aww. and that melted my heart. That's so nice. Yeah it's Aww. great. I love going I love going and talking to the students. I know me too. Yeah. I got a lot of questions about honeybees mm -hmm. which I'm always happy to talk about. <laughs> weather <laughs> so, bees yeah. always. That's just the way it is. <laughs> anyway so how is the weather looking? Well we've been stuck in this pattern uh, for the past couple of days just gray and drizzly mm -hmm. and uh, snowy we're pretty much going to stay there uh, through the next day or so. But uh, temperatures this morning, uh, mild, relatively mild on the uh, eastern portion of the island. Minus three for St. John's as you head towards Central Badger. Uh, normally uh, seeing the coldest temperatures sitting around minus 11 and then uh, some warmer air actually for Lab City. Your temperatures actually climbed uh, through the evening sitting at minus 19 this morning and then uh, the highs reaching minus 16 this afternoon. Otherwise uh, back into those single digits again across the island but staying below zero in most cases, uh, hovering around the zero degree mark for some of the island as well. Uh, as far as that satellite radar goes, you can see a little bit of a low pressure system just tracking over the maritime provinces. Otherwise, we're still in that same air mass, which means onshore flow generally unsettled. Did see a few peaks of sun in the mix today, uh, and then we're seeing some flurry activity along the west coast, and that's uh, the case as well for the Avalon. And that's generally going to continue as we head through the night tonight. Some periods of snow expected along the west coast, uh, parts of the uh, coastal Labrador as well. And then really anywhere on the northeast, we're going to see the potential for uh, some flurries. Uh, could see some heavier bouts of that as well with the uh, chance of some freezing drizzle mixing in. But more than likely going to pick up a few centimeters with this. And uh, temperature wise, we'll start to see uh, the temperatures drop just a little bit, sitting around minus three. So pretty much where we've been sitting for the past couple of days, uh, minus seven for Grand Falls, Windsor, Cornerbrook uh, dropping down to about minus 11 and then back down to those chilly temperatures for Lab City down to minus 26 tonight under clear skies. And eventually you're going to see some clearing really all across the big land uh, through the overnight tonight. Winds generally light out of the northwest uh, for areas in the Avalon, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour uh, through the day. So tomorrow's going to stay unsettled, although more than likely going to see a little bit more sunshine in the mix on the west coast and then heading towards central as well. Uh, but from the northeast really through to the Avalon, some periods of snow expected to continue tomorrow. Again, that risk of some freezing drizzle in the mix just because we're in that onshore flow. And then down along the Beeren Peninsula as well could pick up a few centimeters in the morning. And then again, continuing into the afternoon, certainly for the Avalon, but things will clear out as we head into uh, the evening hours through central, certainly for the northern peninsula. And then some more snow in the mix up through Labrador, mainly uh, for the into the evening hours for central and then up through the northern portions. You're going to see some flurries in the morning. So uh, temperatures again, not moving much, still sitting around minus hovering around the zero degree mark minus one through the day as you head towards Clarenville. Same thing. Um, northerly winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour at times towards central. Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, uh, Twilling Gate sitting around minus four, minus five, Harbor Breton minus three as well. I have that sun icon again in the forecast for tomorrow, not ruling out the chance of some flurries again, though through the day, minus four for gross morn up through St. Anthony, same thing around minus nine, and then we get into sunshine. So Mary's Harbor, Cartwright, really anywhere up through McCovic. Otherwise, you're looking at that risk of flurries through the day with your winds out of the west. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. I'm watching uh, the next system that's going to roll in through the weekend, and I'll have a little bit more detail on that. It was a great guy, great teammate, and uh, you know, I'm so happy that uh, you know this legacy has lived on. That legacy is the life of Danny King, a much loved rugby player and teacher. He was remembered today when students and staff at Waterford Valley High School held a rugby game in his memory.
A village in an outport, Victoria's Heritage Village, one of Newfoundland's best kept secrets. Victoria's Hidden Gem, Sunday at noon and Monday at seven. And welcome back to Here and Now. The saying, one good deed deserves another, certainly holds true here at Rainbow Riders in St. John's. Because of the good deed of one peewee hockey team in Torbay, the therapeutic program here could win $100,000. It's all part of a national contest called Chevrolet Good Deeds Cup. And joining me now to talk more about this is the coach of the hockey team, David Steele, and of Rainbow Riders, Kelly Sandoval, and of course, this is Pickles right here. So let's start with you, Coach. Tell me how all of this came about. Thank you. Uh, in December, we heard about the Good Deeds Cup, and we presented it to our team, and quickly, the team rallied around it. We wanted to do a good deed. Uh, we gravitated to do a good deed for Rainbow Riders because we've heard about the great work they've been doing in the community. Well, Rainbow Riders is a therapeutic riding center, and we provide therapeutic riding for um, clients who have physical, cognitive, and emotional disabilities, uh, obviously focusing more on uh, children and youth. The outcomes are quite magical. One of our teammates has a brother who is a rainbow rider. So we decided to do our good deed by raising enough money to allow for one week of free riding for the kids up here at Rainbow Riders. Word got out that we were doing this good deed and a lot of community and corporate um, corporate citizens decided to, to lean in and match the amounts that we were raising. And before we knew it, we had a little over $21,000. Wow. Yeah, it was quite significant, much more than we needed for one free week of riding. So we were able to uh, help Rainbow Riders purchase a, uh, a badly needed utility vehicle. So one small good deed grew and grew and became something really substantial. It was a great, it was a great, great experience. And it could turn into something even more substantial because your team is now in the top 10 of this national contest. What would this money, $100,000, what would that mean for your programs here? It would be quite amazing and would allow us to do a lot more with our, what we have here, with the, the beautiful facility we have. However, the, the horses obviously require a lot mm -hmm. and also, um, it would allow us to expand and be able to reach even more kids and subsidize more kids and allow for the reach to just uh, take off and I think it would be just a total godsend for us to be able to do that. So how excited are the players about this right now? They are extremely excited. They're over the moon. So the voting period is on. Between now and February 9th, we want to try to get as many people to view our clip. It's a 60 second click, clip on YouTube. And um, what will end up happening is the top three vote getters will move on to the next phase. And then later in February, uh, a panel of judges will select the winner. And right now we're doing fairly well. We're out of the gate. We have a lot of, a lot of views, but we really want to just encourage as many people within the province, outside the province, to get out there and vote for us. Mm. And this is a very important detail because this isn't just like you click and vote. People need to watch 30 seconds of the clip. So you need to go on the website and actually look at the video for this team, right? Exactly. So our, our video clip is 60 seconds long, but in order for it to count as a view, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So um, we're encouraging everyone to view for 30 seconds and please share it with your friends, family, groups that you're a part of people at work and, and I think uh, it's just growing and spreading. So we're off to a good start. So Rainbow Riders, you do a good deed for the children who take part in your program. You do a good deed for raising money for that program. And then everyone at home can do a good deed by going on the website, viewing the video and then casting your vote, right? Exactly. And the slogan that we've been running is with good deeds, everyone wins, and is so true in this particular case. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, from one good deed to another, grade school students on Prince Edward Island are becoming champions for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. They were guest presenters at an awareness conference, and they appear in a new video featuring some of their grandparents. Nancy Russell has more. This is where it all began, a classroom at Georgetown Elementary School, with Cheryl O'Hanley sharing this book called What My Grandma Means to Say. It's the story of a young boy whose grandmother has just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It's just a perfect fit 
for Georgetown. They're so rooted in family here, and grandparents play a very big part in our students' lives. For some of these students, the book hits close to home. And it is kind of hard sometimes when she doesn't remember you, but we do visit her a lot, so she remembers us more now. For others, it's a lesson in the realities of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. That Alzheimer's is not a contagious disease, and like you don't treat them differently just because they don't remember some stuff, because a lot of people don't remember stuff not treat them like they're a baby sometimes and you have to treat them normal just like they treat you and other people treat you. At the end of the book students are asked to raise their hands if they would still visit their grandparents even if they had Alzheimer's or dementia. Inspired by the story the students created memory boxes to share with their grandparents. The Alzheimer's Society of PEI brought along a film crew and talked to the students and their grandparents. There were so many times in that day where the grandparents and the grandchildren, you could see that they truly had a love for each other. One grandmother came up to me and she said, you know, this is my biggest fear is that I'm going to forget her. The students also created their own presentation that they shared at this Alzheimer Awareness Conference. Then it was time for the first public screening of the video featuring the students and their grandparents an emotional experience for many in the crowd. It's powerful. O'Hanley hopes her students will inspire more educators to take advantage of the book about Alzheimer's. What my grandma means to say is available at the Alzheimer's Society. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Georgetown. Well, a snow-covered rugby pitch in the west end of St. John's came to life today as a way to remember a much-loved teacher who died suddenly four years ago. Danny King taught at Waterford Valley High School, and his death in 2016 shook students and staff alike. So much so, there's been a rugby game in his honor ever since. Here are now Cease Hare reports. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, rugby is played on grass, but today it was played in knee-deep snow by male and female members of Waterford Valley High's rugby teams. Many didn't know Danny King, who was the school's phys ed teacher and rugby player, but they've heard of him. He must have been an amazing teacher, like had such an impact on people because not only the students watching, but uh, the students are playing today. Some of them didn't know him, some of them did. And all the rugby community that came out today too, like it shows a really great aspect of him. It's really good to remember him, like it's important and it's good to see that the school puts this together every year. It's great. You know, various stitches. To those who knew him, King was a larger than life mentor, teacher, friend, athlete. Former teammates who were on hand today to ref and help out say that King was a fierce competitor who would appreciate a game in the middle of winter in his memory at the school where he taught. To keep the, the spirit alive, keep the kind of things he stood for alive, the working together as a team when you're on the rugby field, being there for other people were all kind of things which he lived his life by. He was an amazing coach, a mentor uh, for a number of kids, and he really uh, made an impact on kids' lives. So it's nice to see uh, that uh, uh, commemorated with this annual event. And those who worked with him say, athletics aside, King was a true educator. It uh, warms my heart to know that Danny left a legacy that these kids continue on. He loved rugby, he loved teaching, but more importantly, he loved those kids, and he put his heart and soul into it. Danny and I talked so many times about this rugby field and the pitch and how he, we had to have the right posts, and, you know, he was building a rugby empire. He, we had almost 200 kids enrolled in the rugby program uh, at that time. Ricketts says the commemorative rugby game, now in its fourth year, is student-led. They show up each year at her door asking for permission to hold it. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, up next, the latest on the deadly virus that's worrying health officials the world over. We'll hear from the World Health Organization.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, Canada is adding itself to the growing list of countries repatriating their citizens from a region in China that's considered the epicenter of the new coronavirus outbreak. Foreign Affairs Minister Francois Philippe Champagne says Ottawa has secured a plane to bring back those Canadians who want to return. Uh, the next step, obviously, is to work on the diplomatic front and the logistics, obviously, with our uh, Chinese counterparts. Uh, we are engaging in discussion as we speak. Part of those discussions include getting permission to land the plane and get the Canadians out of Wuhan. Champagne says 160 Canadians have asked for consular help so far. The logistical details were slim. Both Champagne and Health Minister Patty Haidu maintain they're still being worked on. They could not provide a timeline for repatriation. Ottawa is asking Canadians to avoid non-essential travel to China. Well, the coronavirus outbreak has claimed 132 lives and infected more than 6,000 people in China. There are nearly 70 confirmed cases in at least 16 other countries, with Finland reporting the first case in the Nordic region. The vast majority of cases outside China have a travel history to China or contact with someone with a travel history to China. There are signs of a few cases of human-to-human transmission outside China in three countries, which we are monitoring very closely. Um, World Health Organization officials are concerned about those few cases, but are commending what they call China's extraordinary measures to contain the outbreak. The country is building two hospitals dedicated to deal with the disease. The epicenter of the outbreak has been quarantined. Meanwhile, British Airways has stopped all flights into the country. Well, that outbreak is having a direct impact on Canada's north. Not from illnesses, it's the crucial tourism industry that's being affected. The Chinese government has suspended all tours out of the country. And as Hillary Bird tells us, that means in Yellowknife, hundreds of expected tourists are nowhere in sight. Tyson Lee's Yellowknife storefront is popular for tourists stocking up on souvenirs. Everything from magnets to mugs plastered with photos of dancing northern lights. So everybody come here for Aurora, that's the May pond. But Lee's main business, selling tour packages to Asian travelers, has taken a big hit. In just three weeks, he's had 200 cancellations from Chinese customers. That's about half of his current bookings for the next two months. And he's been forced to temporarily lay off staff with no end in sight. We got a lot of cancellation uh, from Chinese, Chinese guests. And we still get so, so many emails. Until the problem is solved by the Chinese government, otherwise it's keep going, nobody come here. Every winter, tens of thousands of tourists descend on Yellowknife as the long, dark nights bring spectacular light shows. More of those tourists come from China than any other international country, about 19,500 in 2018 alone. Normally sold out during the peak season, hotels too have had dozens of cancellations. The city's Chamber of Commerce says every one of those puts a dent on the NWT economy. It provides $210 million uh, annually into our economy. If you think about an individual tourist, that's on average, that's about $1,700 or $1,800 per person coming into our local economy. Back at his shop, Lee says he's hopeful business will turn around and that his home country will get things under control. Hopefully we it will solve the problem as soon as possible and everybody can come Yellowknife and enjoy the life. Hillary Bird, CBC News, Yellowknife. New rules are being proposed to fight harassment in the workplace. That story just ahead.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. So before we get to the weather, uh, you have a photo to share with us I from just, this morning. I do. I just wanted to share a couple of photos uh, there. This was Miss Hanlon's grade five class, and I read them, uh, The Boy Who Loved the Rain. Is that awesome? Mm -hmm. That's when we were talking about all that uh, that weather too. And yeah. then I also got to uh, go to Miss Hutchings' grade five class, and there I read Cloudy with a Chance Meatballs, which mm. I've never read number one and never actually saw the movie before. And now I really want to see it. You definitely need to see the movie. Yeah, I thought it was so <laughs> cool how, as a meteorologist, you would be predicting their food choices, <laughs> not the weather. <laughs> yeah, it was a great time. We uh, went to the Literacy Day at Holy Family yeah. Elementary. Yeah, yeah, great time. It was this awesome. Morning. Thanks for having us, yes, guys. Thank you so much for having us. It was wonderful. <laughs> okay, so we'll look ahead now to see what's coming later in the week yep. and the weekend. And the I weekend. Guess. Everybody wants to know. Getting mm -hmm. lots of questions about this one just because we're on the heels of uh, the blizzard, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, let's take a look at that. So we're uh, going to look at Friday first, and we're still under the influence of uh, that air or that low. Air mass is what I should say that we've been seeing. So we're still going to see some uh, flurries through the day. You can see that area of high pressure just to the um, west, and that's going to sink a little bit further south as we head through the day on Friday. Uh, head over, so it should actually clear some skies uh, into the morning hours on Saturday, which is good news. So a little bit of a quiet day for us on Saturday. But here's where we're sitting on Friday. So temperatures will be back uh, down to the minus single digits, which is where we've been sitting for the past little bit, but uh, certainly dropping a few more degrees for eastern portions of the island. Minus four for St. John's with that risk of uh, flurries in the mix really everywhere. Have some sun icons and there might see a few peaks of sun. And then minus 10 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Nain plenty of sunshine, minus 14. And Lab City, same thing, sitting around minus 15. Now, as we head into Saturday, there's that ridge of high pressure. Probably going to see some increasing cloud through the day. Uh, certainly up through Labrador, but a few peaks of sun in the mix. Then we get into the next system. So here's the area of low pressure, uh, area of low pressure right now. That is a little bit not well agreed upon uh, just as to where it's going to track. So right now it's looking like if we take more of a westerly track, central areas will see snow changing over terrain. Same thing for the east, not quite as much though. And then most of the snow will fall on the west coast and we could see uh, some significant amounts with this system. Again, we're going to have to see how that plays out. Winds will also be uh, an issue with this. You know, at this point, we're looking at 70, maybe 90 kilometer per hour winds. But again, that could change uh, as we get a little bit closer to the system. Once that moves out, we're going to continue to see, you know, back into that onshore flow. So that risk of uh, some onshore flurries along the west coast will continue. Here's a look at your next five days. So a drop on Saturday and then right back up. I have a temperature near five degrees on Monday. That's why we're going to see that uh, everything change over to rain and then drop like a rock again on uh, Monday night, down to about minus six, it looks like at this point. For um, central Newfoundland, sunshine on Saturday and then back into the flurries. This will be late day though. Uh, that snow will move in minus uh, five. Overnight low, which is really your high, which will be about one degree. So you'll see a changeover as well at some point. Uh, for western Newfoundland, again, going to stay all snow. So minus five to about zero degrees on Monday and uh, looks like a, a low near minus six. For Eastern Labrador, some flurries to get through for the first or for the next couple of days rather than sunshine for both Saturday and Sunday back into the snow potential on Monday. And then for Western Labrador, sunshine to uh, kick off the weekend, a little bit of flurries in the mix on Sunday and Monday looks like uh, some sunshine. So let's look at your forecast. I have a, a good weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, technological innovation has transformed traditional television, radio, and even online services. And that's left large gaps in regulation of those services. But now an independent panel is recommending changes, including a renewed push for Canadian content and new ideas about how to pay for it. Eli Glasner reports. For years, many in the telecommunications and broadcasting sector said it was time to update the Broadcasting Act, written before the internet became such a big part of our daily lives. The CRTC and federal government agreed and commissioned a panel. Now the report is out and the authors are not holding back, recommending dramatic changes. But panel chair Janet Yale says homegrown content shouldn't be drowned in the new digital age. As Canadians, we also expect that there will always be a place for Canadian voices and perspectives. 
To bring the regulations in line with our connected age, the authors recommend foreign streaming services such as Netflix be compelled to contribute part of their programming budget to Canadian shows. But Yale says the investments shouldn't raise subscription rates. Look, <laughs> they spend a lot of money domestically and globally producing uh, content. And we're not, it's not necessarily the case that this is going to increase their program budgets. What we're saying is that the, a portion of those program budgets, which are significant, must be, uh, must qualify as Canadian. So we do not think that this is something that would be passed on to consumers or result in higher prices. The report also has a lot to say about adjusting Canadian content rules for the age of the algorithm. If the main way you watch is to surf the Netflix homepage, Canadian shows might not appear. But the report suggests forcing streamers to ensure Canadian content is visible and easy to find. In its submission to the panel, Netflix described such practices as anti-consumer and said as a media provider who doesn't draw from Canadian content creation funds, it shouldn't be obligated to contribute. The panel also had much to say about the CBC itself, suggesting the public broadcaster be totally funded by the government and drop all advertising in five years. The authors of the report also encourage the government to bring internet access to all Canadians and suggest the federal government provide broadband access in areas where private companies won't. All in all, the report envisions a new, more expansive role for the CRTC and changes to the bedrock of the Canadian film and TV industry. While the Liberal government has promised to deliver a new bill within a year, asked about whether it's realistic considering the ambitious changes, the Minister of Heritage had this to say. Let's talk about this at the end of this year and we'll see how much we will have been able to achieve, but we have the firm intention to deliver uh, on our commitment to table a bill uh, to, to modernize the Broadcasting Act this year. And with Ottawa playing host to the primetime conference of TV and filmmakers, the recommended changes are sure to be the talk of the town. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Ottawa. The allegations against Harvey Weinstein helped usher in the Me Too movement. Women are increasingly coming forward with their own stories of sexual harassment, especially in the workplace. Diane Buckner looks ahead to proposed new federal legislation intended to fight it here in Canada. She was a senior IT systems analyst, experienced and highly paid. Nowadays, Sarah is on a long-term disability leave. We're not identifying her because she says she was sexually harassed on the job. He would just grab me and put his arm on my shoulder uh, like this, you know, really close to here. And his face was so close to me and I got extremely uncomfortable. So I pushed him away. I said, no, what, what are you doing? She I says said, it was one of her bosses who got what? physical. And uh, that's not the worst part. They actually forced me back to work with him within two hours after I, I, I complained sexual harassment. Three, they are she went to her union, no luck there either. Sarah ended up in hospital with anxiety and depression. Some sexual harassment cases feature famous names or big settlements, like the $100 million the RCMP paid to settle a class action harassment lawsuit. But there are countless lesser-known cases in Canada. It is ubiquitous. It happens everywhere. Um, and um, in the wake of Me Too, there have been um, all sorts of surveys from every uh, type of workplace that you can imagine, and it's, it's rampant. Employment lawyer Janice Rubin was hired by CBC to investigate the Gameshi case. She says a new federal law is coming this year. The employer has to actually proactively look at the workplace and figure out where the risk is. Bill C-65 spells out new responsibilities for all federally regulated industries, such as communications, transportation, the public service, to prevent workplace violence and harassment. This has to be solved. This is an indicia of inequality. Um, these are old behaviors from an old type of workplace that still haven't disappeared. The Weinstein court case has already resulted in other victims in other workplaces coming forward. Now Canadian employers better get ready to prevent new cases from ever happening. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Take a look at this beauty shot. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Welcome back. I want to share this photo with you. Beautiful, pristine was, conditions. Yep, Buren Peninsula just taking a, a ride off Blue Hills. Jason Nolan sent us that great shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Great. <laughs> That's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and have a great evening. Good night.